It's time for this week's Wrestling Perspective podcast. We call this episode 386 with Aaron Stevens. I'm going to say probably two out of three of us have been in Rolling Stone magazine, and I'll let everybody guess who it isn't. Uh, <laughs> Lars Fredrickson, Dennis Farrell, Aaron Stevenson, Wrestling Perspective this week. Aaron, thank you so much for hanging out. We have like a million questions for you. We are so excited to have you on. Hey, I am uh, truly honored to be here. Like I said, this is uh, this is really cool for me, and you know, just uh, getting to it uh, because you get to meet me, right? I mean, of, of course, yes, yeah. of course, yeah. Even though I you're mean, just on the little screen, right? I mean, it's it's a virtual meeting, but you know, whatever. I'll, I'll nonetheless, take it. Nonetheless, yeah. nonetheless, nonetheless. Uh, Hashtag 2020, right? That's whatever. When I'll, I'll be honest, when I sent Lars the text saying, "Hey, uh, we got Aaron this week," he the the response back from him was. Holy cow, he's on the bucket list of guys we wanted to talk to. So oh, wow. to take time to talk to us, we definitely appreciate it. No, I mean, I'm I'm truly honored, seriously. So thank yeah. you, guys. And it only took 386 episodes, and I'll be honest with you. <laughs> you were playing hard to get. Mr. 386, that's my, you know what? I, I should change my little, if I allow, you know what? I'm, I don't want to get out of the Zoom, but I, I think it should be hashtag Mr. 386. Uh, and the yes. next time I come on here, if, if you'll have me back, depending it's on how this show goes, it'll be 386 one wins by count out. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, listen, uh, NWA is coming to St. Louis, August 26, I believe it is. Uh, really excited. That's kind of where I grew up, one of my hometowns. And uh, to be able to sit down and talk NWA, your acting career, and doing research, I totally forgot. That it was like 2016 when you were released from WWE, you enter this whole new world of wrestling. And looking back at that, I, I you look back at a rose-colored glasses, at least I do, because you think the industry is what it was now, then. And you have to take a step back and remember, like, AEW wasn't there. I think the indies were just starting to heat up at that point in, in that time. You were a guy that always takes uh, pride into uh creating characters evolving yourself now you have hit this market where i maybe maybe looking back at it i can say it was like a beer wrestling market was how did you approach reinventing yourself and maybe trying to stay relevant in this i guess wrestling world that we kind of forgot was just growing um you know it's funny that's a it's an interesting time in my life because um you know, at Impact, I um, and I really had no desire to, but like they reached out to me shortly after I had left WWE, and, and I had gotten a fair amount of press um, from leaving WWE, like more, way more than I thought, um, which was very flattering. And I was in not necessarily the best space um, in terms of my relationship with the wrestling industry because, you know, and I don't really like, not to sound like the, you know, I. I I'm bitter because I'm not, I'm truly not. But I mean, like, look, creatively, what WWE was doing with me and what I felt, you know, I should be getting as far as opportunities based solely on the response I was getting from fans. Uh -huh. And um, I did an autograph signing, you know, for an example, um, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the guys that was um, was kind of putting the signing on said, hey, I got to let you know something. My friend works for WWE and he worked for them when you were there. OK, and I knew his name. I knew who we were talking about. And he said, uh, yeah, they would get the house show reports back and they would list the biggest pops of the night. And he's like, you were always like there was Cena and then you. And then it got to a point where when they would bring that back, that certain people in the office will remain nameless because I'm not that guy to, you know, name names and bury people, whatever. But like they said, just don't even mention him anymore. So like that's that's how far and I, I just kind of learn this like that's how far removed i was from any opportunity where they didn't want to hear my name but they yet they kept me on the road to for whatever right and it's all good like look that's that's the entertainment industry it ain't uh ballet you know and and it's not all fair and that's life um but at the same time as a performer um i'm just kind of going like what do i have to do because i was i was blowing the roof off the place whatever and um so it had left a very bitter taste in my mouth. And then I had the opportunity for impact and, you know, a bunch of my friends were there. So I got to go there and kind of get creative and stuff. But then like, ultimately, you know, there was uh, an administrative change and I kind of had to look in the mirror 
And and I had left wrestling after that. I, I did a couple of years where I just disappeared and, and did the acting thing because like I owe it not only to myself um, because, and I say myself first, because if I had wanted to just collect a paycheck, like what I, what you do out there, especially nowadays, and, and this really goes for anything, even like podcasts, right? It's in perpetuity. It, it will live on forever. And um, I could not look at myself in the mirror and say, hey, the body of work that I am willing to do now will be a standard um, or, or will be standard for what I think my body of work should be. And I just had to make the decision. I said, you know what? Peace out. Um, Cause it ain't there. And I'm not going to uh, do that to myself. More importantly, I'm not going to do that to the fans. Um, like I living in the WD bubble, right? Like I, it was always, they'd hit my music. I'd come out cool. And we had this cool response and I'd occasionally do a personal appearance, but after I left WWE, I did do a couple signings and everything, and I was just like genuinely touched where people were like, oh, we still remember you, this and that. And like even the autograph signing I did, I, I was blown away, really. Like I'm like, oh, wow. Um, and uh, it, it's very, very cool. It, it's it's a um, it, it's, it's humbling. It's flattering. and At the same time, it's more motivation for me to kind of, um, again, pour everything I have into what I do, because uh, this is, a, you know what? It's, it's episode 386. Yep. In honor of 386, here's a little bit of tid, here's a tidbit of information. I don't, I say one of the most influential people, and I don't mean that in terms of like we were super tight or anything like that. But when I was, I was a kid and uh, it was the first seminar I ever did with Dr. Tom, wait before I was signed or anything. Balls Mahoney happened to be on the show. And Balls Mahoney said, and I, I didn't, I didn't understand it like i do now but he, he gave an amazing piece of advice he goes every time you leave the ring you should be a little bit blown up no matter how good a shape you're in because that way you knew you gave those people everything you had wow. and um mm -hmm. i am actually like and believe it or not i'm actually like cardiovascular wise i've never really blown up in the ring because kowalski just said don't ever blow up when i first started and that's philosophically like all right cool i'm never gonna blow up i'm always gonna be able to do it but you know, the last 10 years of my career, really, um, there was an emotional exhaustion because like uh, anyone that's worked with me, like will tell you, like when we go out there, like there's an understanding where, hey, if something happens, like we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to do whatever business we have to do. Right. It's not like we're going to switch finishes. But if uh, if we go out there and there's room for magic, as I call it, you know, where the fans are just into something and buying it and, and we whether it's a promo, whether it's in the ring, um, we're going to, we're going to harness that and we're going to go with it. And um, I've been very lucky enough to where like people have trusted me and, um, and we've always gotten there and, and just had a lot of, a lot of fun, but point being, it, it's literally an emotional exhaustion because I am, I am putting everything, even as a manager, I, and I will say this, right. I sweat more as a manager than I do like, or than I do was in the ring. It was, it's crazy because like, it's literally like this, you just, you, you, you just pour everything you have into a bottom line. And I think like that maybe is a little bit of the reason why um, I've been able to kind of have the rapport with the fans I have. Um, and even to this day, which is just, it's mind blowing really. When Dennis brought the idea and told me that we, we, we were going to get you on the show, I started thinking about a house show I went to around this time that you're talking about. And I do remember you from the crowd reaction. And then I started to kind of think about what's happening in today's modern wrestling, like with, with a case like LA Knight. It's like, here's this guy that's so over and they never did anything, right? They're kind of finally starting to catch on. And I started, wow. That's so interesting because you were almost that guy back then where you were getting so much more uh, over than the company almost wanted you to in a lot of ways. Like there well, was I mean, really it happened twice. You know, it happened with Money in the Bank. Um, right. And then, you know, it's like, all right, just have him dress up as someone new every week. And then, okay, and then I wrestle the Invisible Man. And, um, right. you know, um, it, it, it happened twice. Well, and, but this, um, is, this is my my point. Do you feel 
like in retrospect, looking back and, you know, everything happens for a reason. You, you move on, you know, you, other things, one door closes, another one opens. But does a part of you, you know, and this is kind of the, the last I really want to touch on this era of your career because you've done so much more, you know, but does a part of you look like, at a guy like L.A. Knight and think, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much are you are you you are watching wrestling, but man, I can really relate to that guy. Um, you know, I, it's in the sense of like I'm like, dude, just keep going, just keep going. They can't deny you. You know what I mean? And well, they could deny you, but um, you know, I I want to see him succeed because um, you know, I don't harbor any like, oh, it should have happened to me. No, you know, it was what it was, and um, like I said, it's fine. Like I I can. If I want a job in wrestling, I'll get one, right? Like right. I, I can always fall back on my skill set, right? Um, LA Knight is in a position where, you know, um, he is being highlighted. And I hope that um, they listen to the fans because ultimately the fans are the ultimate arbiter of what is good and what is not good. They they are the boss, ultimately. Um, and I know in a publicly traded company, when you're dealing with shareholders and everything, and, and you can make that argument. Um, in that respect, and I'm sure music is, is very similar, right? When like you, the true art of it, um, it, it's getting lost. And I, I, I don't know if music is the case, although I, as a fan of music, I, I kind of see that, right. Where it's like just this manufactured, you know, um, stuff with no, with no soul into it. Right. And, um, I, I hope that WWE makes the right decision with LA Knight. And, and and the thing is, everyone knows what the right decision is. So there, there you go. Well, Dennis, I'm sorry, but I need to kind of keep going. You know, we just, you know, we're finding out now, you know, because it's still somewhat of the same there where they're piping in. We want tables on their pay-per-views because everybody that I know that was inside that last, you know, event, you know, the crowd was, you know, dead. But what we get as an audience at home is a whole different presentation, right? It's disgraceful. And it's, it's, I mean, it, it reminds me of like WCW Saturday night with, you know, and the audio would just be all mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But I, I guess for me, the, the, where I'm trying to get at with you right now is, you know, I know that you're not bitter of your, your situation. Cause you, and, all, and honestly, you can look back at that and say, you kind of left on top in a lot of ways. But so, yeah. you know, you know, having these new roads sort of opening up for you and now being part of the NWA, what is your experience from that situation in particular? What do, what are you now bringing to the to NWA that is helpful in the sense of like uh, how to get yourself over? Um, <clears throat> the answer, Lars, and this is God's honest truth, is I have no idea. I have, it is a switch I have in my brain. Mm -hmm. And like, I, that I cannot tell you why. Um, it's like when I go through the curtain, it's almost like that something else, it just happens, right? And I am completely like, I don't give a crap about like, okay, the, the physical stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm trained to do that. Like, all right, if I can't, you know, do what I do in the ring, there's a serious problem. You know what I mean? Like, um, so that stuff is just like, eh, whatever. Um, it is literally me like trying to connect with, in, in with everyone in the audience. And then this is how I, I guess I do it. I don't look at the audience as 20,000 people, 500, 1,000, 1,500, whatever, right? 2,000, whatever it is. I look at the audience as one living, breathing mass. And it is my job to excite that one entity uh, or make them, and I say excite, right? Like like elevate their emotions, whether the emotion be um, disdain, adulation, you know, uh, a smile, a lot, whatever it is, right? Because I've it's been cool. Like I I've played with the entire spectrum of emotions. I'm not afraid to do comedy. Um, I know I can make people hate me within 20 seconds. I can have an arena. No, I mean, that's just, that's what it is. Right. Um, I've reached a point now where I think I can, you know, get them to like me if I haven't. And, and I I've always, 
I always approach every show like nobody knows who I am. And that way I put everything I have into it. And, and, and I approach everything like this, my, my livelihood, my job depends on it. Cause it really does. And, and I think that kind of just, it's my frame of mind when I go out there. And, um, but it's that combined with like, look in the ring. Yes. I know how to not hurt anybody, make it look believable. If anything happens, the top rope breaks, whatever, like, it'll be fine. Right. And that just comes with time. And, and I, I've had some of the best trainers in the world, really. But um, it's like all that training has simply allowed me to relax and be a performer. And, and to your point, right, with the piping into the crowd noise and all that, it is disgraceful because anyone that calls themselves a professional and I, and I think I am not knocking the style today at all. Right. L.A. Knight's one of the most over guys we have. You don't see him doing two pays, toe pays and, and all that other stuff. Right. Now, there, there are some amazing athletes, and I think that's awesome, right? The business needs to have a progression. Sure. However, what we have seen now, we have sacrificed the soul of what wrestling is, and, and it's like music, right? Where, like, people are sitting in a boardroom. Oh, yeah, they do this. This is cool. We could, And no one cares. The people are popping or they're cheering for a move, yeah. not the person. Because if they cared about the person in the ring, you wouldn't have to pipe crowd noise in. And one of the things I am completely confident, whether it's a manager or a performer, if you put me out there, you know, unless you tell me to do step A, B, C, D, which actually that happened before, I'm not going to get into it and I still find a way, but, um, you know, I will, I will do what needs to be done to ensure that everybody is, is rocking one way or another. And, um, and that goes to your dance partner too, right? I mean, um, I've worked with some very good people. Um, I've really never had an issue with anybody um, because again, like I'll make a decision, but and I'm not trying to sound whatever, you know, I trust my personal life and everything else. I have so much, I got more issues than Rolling Stone, but um, out there when I make a decision, it's usually right. Usually Lars and I get together. We have a little phone call. We talk about the guest and Lars brought up a good point on this phone call. He goes, if you look back at NWA and the changes they had, one of the constants is you. You've you've been there, the cornerstone. And I was like, ah, let me go back and look. And then you kind of look through the rosters and the months and the dates and you go, holy shit. You know, it feels like this company is being built around you without everybody saying this company is being built around you. It, it, as the guy that is kind of the center or a cornerstone of this this company, do you notice that? Do you take that in? Do you take any like extra responsibility on yourself? Uh, no, no, because uh, I, simplicity is bliss, right? Um, and and I say that in terms of a performance, in terms of the wrestling business, really. But but how I personally go about things is like, look we get our marching orders, right? Like, this is what you're going to do tonight. Okay. This is, you know, with wrestling, I, I and I never approach it like, oh, I, this has to be the best. No, no. I always look, what are we doing next time, right? So to prime the audience for next time, we have to put everything we have into tonight, right? Like it's going into Mania or like the biggest pay-per-view. Because sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But in doing that, um, so I worry about the next time, but I don't worry about what I'm doing next, if that makes sense. So therefore I am just completely focused on what I'm doing now. And again, I approach every single time, every promo I do, every time I go out to the ring, like nobody knows who I am. And, um, and you know, it's like, I go into that mindset and then usually I come out and like, I hear them. All right. But then when I hear them, it's it's like this weird kind of like energy exchange that goes on to where I'm like, okay, like you're going to cheer for me. Well, then I'm going to give you something to cheer about. Or are you going to boo me? You know, I'm going to give you something to boo. And, and it's just, it's cool. It, it's the best. It's, um, it's what was missing in my life. If I'm being honest, like with NWA, I was, I was completely out of the business and um, I was in Hawaii doing an episode of Magnum PI. And got a call and like, hey, uh, we're doing some NWA tapings. Congratulations. You need to come back to work. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I'm in, I'm in Waikiki Beach because it was like, it was great. It was Labor Day weekend. And 
like it was one episode, but I was there for like three and a half weeks because the days off and everything, um, which is why we have unions, which it was amazing. Um, although it was interesting because Waikiki is very touristy. And I remember I had PF Changs a lot, which is uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and the Mai Tais in Ho and, and Waikiki. This is a I, I nothing against. I, I love Hawaii, but the Mai Tais in Waikiki, they do not compare to the Mai Tai at Kowloon's in Boston. So that's not a plug. Wait, for you're a Boston guy, aren't you? I grew up in Massachusetts. Yeah, I live in Kentucky now, um, but grew up there. Got trained by Kowalski there. So like right. Kowloon's was just a staple before I even set foot right. in a WWE ring. Like I yeah. knew the Wongs and everything. And yeah, yeah. It, was, uh, it was cool. Well, my wife is from the, the Cape. Oh, where at? Uh, Brewster. Okay. Yeah. My family, we used to, we had a summer home in, um, Dennis. Born in Brock. Dennis. Yeah, Dennis. It's it was real, on the inside of the cake. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was cool. It's Dennis is close to, to, to Brewster. Route six. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We all I'm have sorry. a Boston connection because I was born in Brockton. Yeah. So yeah. oh my god, well, wow, cool. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So we're 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 all we all got a question. We all got a connection there. <laughs> um <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I always wanted to kind of ask is because you come from the WWE, you know, that's kind of where you really cut your teeth. There's a certain kind of booking style. There's a certain kind of expectation. You know, then you go out to the Indies, you land yourself in the NWA. You know, the booking is obviously very different. It's a different mentality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you feel like you can walk into any company and just kind of understand it from the very get-go now? Yes. You've had all this experience with, you know, obviously Impact, you know, the WWE um, and NWA. And if if you could give a quick synopsis of of you know of the okay, does Billy Corgan have anything to do with the booking? Yes. Okay. So now when you guys are working out the show and working out, you know, whatever is gonna happen or whatever, how is it different from your ideas being presented over here up north and where you're at right now? Is it a very drastic difference or is oh, it yeah. okay? Oh yeah, like up north, you know, things are laid out. Um, one of the things promo-wise, I will say that I am eternally grateful to Vince. And again, I'm just being straight up right now with this. Is several times the writers would hand me like, oh, this is your promo. Now, I, I've worked with some amazing writers. Um, Matt McCarthy was awesome. Tori, um, or Tony, excuse me. Um you know, uh, dude, Mike Notarelli, in incredible writers. But there were some writers that like really thought like, oh, this is what you had. And I would be like, uh-uh. And I would go to Vince and I would say, boss, I have two minutes for this promo. I guarantee you, I will, you know, sell the upcoming pay-per-view or say, you know, say what needs to be said. May I please say it my own way. I would always get the, go ahead. I would hit my time. There'd be no issue. And that is something that I, I truly, truly was grateful for because on that stage, they don't do that to a lot of people. Right. Um, and, and, you know, and, but as a result, I gave them really good work. You know, I hit my time in a I, I was, I was known for hitting my time all the time. Um, but it's, it's still very, very monitored. And, and I, I say overproduced, look, not a lot of talent likes to go into business for themselves or they're just simply not good enough to be able to go out there, rock the place, be in control enough to tell your story to the second on live TV, make everything look believable. Like there's a lot going on there, right? Now, on top of that, you're in your underpants and whatever in front of 20,000 people. Um that's my comfort zone. That's my happy place. Um, but you have to do it like that, right? Because it ensures quality, right? And it ensures the execution of the vision. Uh, with Billy and, and him and I, I mean, I, I've never had a relationship with a boss like I had with Billy because like we, and, and he, he's somebody I consider a friend. Um, but it's just like, hey, you're doing this today. Yeah, great. See ya. Awesome. And like, yeah. it's it, like, he, he trusts me immensely. And, um, and you know, it goes two ways. I trust him because 
we talk about different environments. Like I've worked in environments where it is absolute chaos, where nobody knows what's going on. Um, I've been ready to go through the curtain and they say, oh, switch your match or doing this, that, whatever, right? We can do that. I don't, who, who cares? Um, to your first question or second question, like going into any environment, do I feel I can adjust it? Yes, absolutely. I, I feel it, it is what it is. You get the lay of the land. And look, at the end of the day, all it is is like, all right, they're going to at some point hit your music. You're going to go through the curtain and do the best you can to, you know, in line with the the creative vision and the audience's um, entertainment. Right. That's all. That's all. It's it's not rocket science, really. And I, I've right. I've kind of maintained that calmness. And it's funny because some people like in the back, like if, if someone doesn't know me. Um, they can think I'm very like lackadaisical and I don't care and this and that um, because I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. But and it's funny. This happened multiple times. Like once they've gone out there, they come to the back and they're like, oh, my God. Whoa. And like, yeah, you know, like there's no need to be discussing things for five hours. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, let's do it like the pros do it. Yeah. Because let, let's let's be pros. You know, I mean, it's no different, right? I mean, yes, you have to rehearse certain things, right? Of course, right? Like as a musician, right? You you do what you got to do, the sound checks, all that. But then like you've done it long enough. It's like, no, all right. It's it's yeah. time to go to work yeah, kind of deal. Sure. Yeah. For sure. You know, looking at your career as a fan, and uh, I had my fanboy moment before Lars got here. So, you know, sorry, buddy, you missed out on it. There, there were uh, tears involved. I'm kidding. I, I'm kidding. I, yeah, I cried like a baby. Sure I was like was tears oh, and hard ons. It was, <laughs> it was like the Beatles. He, I felt like he just came to America for the first time. I was a screaming little girl. I passed out in the crowd. It was crazy. <laughs> Smelling salts. But uh, to bring it back, uh, I... Looking back at your career, you were always the guy that was like, you you made it to the top you and you never carried that big prestigious belt, right? Mm -hmm. Is is in your mind, the fact that you made a living, does that make it a successful career? Or are you like, you know what, I would love to have been the guy to carry a company as their face champion or heel champion, but the guy, do you, how do you measure your, the sex sex of your career? I'm going to say two words, Roddy Piper. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, do we, uh, you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so you were a fan. Roddy never held a heavyweight title, mm -hmm. but there have been people that have been the champion that have been WWE champion that cannot touch Roddy in the overall spectrum, right, of, of wrestling, in the overall sphere, where I would much rather kind of be etched into the minds of fans than to have a piece of leather and gold, which is great. It, it would have been nice, not going to lie. It would have been nice. It was a goal of mine. Um, but at the end of the day, what I got was way cooler, way, way cooler. Because you can't, like, you can't fake, right? Like, like it, it's winning the title is like winning an Oscar. It's amazing, incredible. But what I did, and it was really kind of not by any like help of the office in terms of the level I got to. Um, that was on me, and and that that I did that myself. And to anyone that's trying to aspire to do this and, and that like here's here's the whole <sighs> riddle of it right i got over on my own but the only reason i got over on my own because i never made it about me i always made it about the fans always yeah. and i still do i never ever approach a match selfishly which is why i know anything i do anywhere in the world i will get the reaction i want because it's all about the fans You know, we touched on modern wrestling, like what it is now, and it definitely is a far cry from maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I think we saw elements of that back then, but we didn't see it like one whole TV show with nothing but, you know, it's now just the norm. Um, and people are taking a lot more high risks, and it seems like there's, a, it's, a, it's almost like 
there's more demands on on someone's personal self to do a crazy flip or whatever the hell it might be. Um, do you think that there's an opportunity for us to pull back and maybe bring Report. a little bit more, you know, a slower pace? Do you think there's room for that in today's modern wrestling as far as as your vision as a wrestler, mm -hmm. as maybe a fan? I mean, let's look at L.A. Knight, and I don't think we need a, a better example in the WWE right now than him. Fans want it. And, like, if a, if I'm in the WWE and, and, or, or anywhere, all right, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to make everyone notice me. If, if I think I'm going to do a, a move or a flip short of lighting myself on fire and doing a header into a uh, a pool of sharks with laser beams attached to their fins. It could happen. Yeah, you never know. But like, I'm, no, everyone, all right, everyone has cool tights. Everyone has like their mo entertain me or don't entertain, connect with me. Who are you? Who, again, there's a reason I will get more of a reaction out of a punch or a simple punch or a simple kick done correctly than a lot of these people do with their big moves. And again, not knocking them. I think big moves are awesome, a natural part of the evolution. However, if you watch a lot of matches, like any match I'm involved with, the finish, th that's when the fans are that at their loudest, right? It's like that emotional release. Like, the you know, the term pop, it, um, it's, it came from a sexual term originally. And you can, under, you know, imagine what that is, you know? Mm -hmm. Pop, pop goes the weasel because the weasel goes pop. You know what I'm saying? Um, but it literally, I mean, once you pop, you got to stop. You know what I mean? Because uh, that's it. <laughs> and a match is the journey up to that point. Right. And you can get a, a holy shit. Oh, can we swear? Sorry. Um, yeah, we can fucking uh, cuss. Oh, thank you. Well, you can get a holy shit. Did he, did he just fucking cuss on our fucking podcast? I am so fucking sorry. Fucking, fucking Dennis, what kind of fucking guys? What kind of fucking vetting process do we have here? Well, we actually used to bleep. I get it. He magnum fucking PI, but like, you know, no then he comes on here and drives, drops F-bombs. Anyways. <laughs> we we actually had a bleep, but our bleep budget is already out. So <laughs> now we just have to go. Maybe we're going to have to call the network later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mom! Um, Mom. <laughs> you, um, yeah. Was that go ahead? Sorry. Oh no, I was. Please go ahead. Um. So no, it, it's essentially like like I said with anything else. Um. If you can just connect with the person, right? It, it's the journey there, and then they're going to remember you more, right? Um. It, it's so sad to see talented people. Like they get lighting in a bottle. And I, again, I don't like to name names. Everyone's trying to make a living and I am not going to sling shade at anybody. Cause that's, that's never been my style. Like I've, I'm not a politic or never was. Maybe that my career would have been better if I was, but guess what? I can look at myself in the mirror. Um, but going back to that, right. There was an example of someone who a couple of years ago was really over like what he was doing. Fans were digging. And he was one of, if not the most over people in his company. And now that time has gone on, like he's nowhere near what he was. And you have to understand how to stay over. Look, I wrestled the invisible man. It wasn't that interesting second or third week, but there was ways to do things, how I was doing it. it it's the timing. It's the pauses. It's... um. You know, and again, I'm going to try a music analogy and I'll probably fall flat on my face. But like, if you teach me how to play, like, what, what, what's a musical note? Like uh, an A on a guitar? Sure, sure. Uh, an A. You teach me how to play an A, right? Okay, technically, I can sit there and play an A. And then you say, this is an A, and then you follow it with a, a note, a B. Okay, boom, boom. All right, the notes are the notes, but it's the space in between. Right. It's how you play, you, you know, put that, as I say, put the hot sauce on it. You put your own kind of soul into it a little bit. Um, and that's what's missing. Right. That's it, it's the stuff in between. Right. You know, there's an art to this and the art has been replaced with, you know, the circus. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with the circus, but like 
meld the two and evolve. But again, like to your question, I mean, LA Knight is the perfect example. The, the human condition hasn't changed, right? Yes, we live in a society that's more disposable. We have Instagram. We have all these things, right? Um, and people want it now, 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 now. But if you can keep their interest and at the same time allow fans to digest and appreciate you one way or another, right? Boo, cheer, whatever. It's going to serve the individual more. And I tell you what, there's a reason I'm not going to say how old I am, but um, there's a reason I don't have any injuries and I am healthy as a horse. And with a lot of these people today, um, and, and again, not for nothing, but these are much smaller people. Um, you know, their their bodies aren't necessarily built for taking the impact, I believe, right? Um, in general, right? I'm not trying to, again, sling shit anybody, but like the, the, the wrestlers are a lot smaller today. Um, and again, not good, bad, or, or indifferent. It just is what it is. Um, so, look... To anyone, just just remember, it's about the fans, not you. And I just want to ask as a follow-up, and this is probably my dirt sheet question, but is it true that like the Invisible Wrestler was really hard to work with and he was always politicking and he was really trying to bury you and get over on you before you heard this? I heard this. Yeah. There there were times I had to potato him. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, I I had to sneak one in and be like, dude, calm down. I had to have that conversation with him out there. Um, but you know, once he, uh, once, once he fell in line, he was actually cool. Um, you know, um, that in the, uh, they saw anyone could have a match with a broomstick. You know, he, he was trying to surpass the broomstick in terms of being the standard for, uh, you know, inanimate objects or, or, or no objects at all. Um, and, um, yeah, so he was, he, he was a bit of a jerk in the beginning, but then, you know, we, uh, checked him a little bit, shall we say. Uh, eat, but, your, eat your heart out, Meltzer and Alvarez. <laughs> uh, Don't get me started. Do, I mean, <laughs> here, here's the thing. You know what? And, and I'm not, look. We all gotta make, we Speak all gotta your make mind, somehow, bro. Right? Speak your mind. We, we all got to make a living somehow. And I'm not like what Meltzer thinks is the wrestling business is. It is not. He is judging it based on athletic performances and whatever. I mean, to not give Hogan and Rock five stars. Dude, like, what is wrong with you, right? Um, come on, you you nitwit. <laughs> no, but but and look, I I don't know him. I've never met him. Um, like, certainly, I've never gotten a five star match from him. However, I don't need a five star rating because I am a star. No, there I, you go. Yeah, well, I, I think the star system, you know, however he tries to break it down, I you know, I don't necessarily know if I've ever comprehended uh, in his own words when he was asked a question one time and I was listening to it because it was it was very, you know, intriguing to me on how he sees things. He should and... be a figure skating judge at the Olympics. Seriously. <laughs> like, well, West, again, West German. If you're a star, <laughs> you don't need a star rating. Right. But I, 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 yes, and no, I, and and I'm with you on that. Uh, but uh, you know, because I was obviously a subscriber to the Observer back, you know, 25 years ago, however long ago, maybe longer. At, you know, because I was always I was involved with the the sort of more underground tape trading thing stuff way back, you know, and I feel like there was a very niche, uh, kind of like core group of fans i mean i know that there was like more of the smart marks in the 70s and this and i'm sure there were some in the 60s but in the late 80s early 90s definitely i could uh would say i would i for i was more like one of those guys now i feel like every wrestling fan you know the standard is the smart mark you know what i mean there is not that person that that uh that doesn't know everything about it almost, you know what I mean? It's like you run into a lot of fans and they know what the ratings are, or, you know, cause it's all out there. WrestleNomics, these things, you know, it's just a different way to be a fan. Now, do you, uh, you know, do you think that's better or worse for the business? So I think again, you know, ultimately, um, and look, had it not been for wrestling fans, I would not have the life I have. And I, I truly like, Longest relationship I've ever had with a woman is two years, right? So, <laughs> again, you talk about whatever issues. But um, my relationship with wrestling fans has been the most stable 
relationship I've ever had in my life. And I truly love them to the point of every time I go through that curtain, I know I am going to be emotionally spent, right? Like can't do anything after because I'm that emotionally spent. And I love it and I'll do it every single time for the rest of my life, for the rest of of my career. But I also, some of the best compliments I've ever gotten in my life were, hey, my wife, my brother, my so-and-so, they don't like wrestling. We took them to a show and you were their favorite. And that's happened a lot, right? So I have always tried to appeal. Like, And the thing is, Okay, when I, as a character, and I think one of the reasons I've been so successful is because what I do is for the fans, 100%, right? I, I've said that redundantly here. But I appeal, right, to a far broader spectrum because when, when I'm making up a character, in which is usually as I'm going along, right, um, I try to touch upon things that have to do with the human condition, right? Not... You know, oh, I'm going to slap my leg and do a little insider joke here and haha. No, 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 no. I want to make human beings feel something, whether I'm Sandow and I have to, you know, like, like there was an art to a Sandow promo. Like I had to insult people here. It had to go just enough above their head to where they don't know what I said, but they know I insulted them. Like they could kind of feel the right so it's kind of like, and it's that, oh, well, he insulted us and he used a word we don't know. So we feel stupid. Therefore, I really hate this guy. You know what I mean? And it was like that double kind of, and then I take off, I had the pink and everything. And I I was, it wasn't the fact that I had pink and purple on. It was the fact that I was oblivious. Right? Because I never like sold the pink. You know what I mean? I never did like any kind of sassy movements or anything like that. No, it was, I was oblivious to it. And and that was like, that's how you play that, right? And then so like those layers, like the 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 Mizdow, right? No, it wasn't me goofing. No, it was me. It was a sad, it was satirical. It was like, you're going to, and the New York fans, the Philly fans, they're the first ones to like have it catch on. They got it. Like, you're going to use me in this way? Well, guess what I'm going to do now on your TV show? This which was never planned. I just started doing it one day. Right. So like, but the thing is I did it not to like, and it wasn't born out of like, Oh, I'm going to get them back. No, 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 no. It was born out of like, let's give something to the fans that they're going to remember. Let's give them their money's worth. And then some that's all. And that that's any company I work for. Like, I mean, I'm a very loyal soldier. Like you give me my marching orders, they will be executed. And you know, usually expectations will be exceeded. And whether I get opportunities past that point, that's really out of my control. I I know we're going to be wrapping this up here in a few minutes. I got a few questions. I know Lars does too, but I want to bring this back to like the very beginning of this interview where you were talking about this dark time when you left the Federation. What was that moment where you rediscovered your love for wrestling? And I'm maybe I'm putting words in your mouth or assuming that you lost that love for wrestling. Oh, I did. Do you remember what what brought you back to it? Because it, at least for me, it sounded like in every interview I've ever heard that you were kind of really done with it. You're were, you were ready for this next chapter, whether it's acting or working in an oil change place. You were just washed your hands of it. Yeah, because it's funny, like I'm not, a lot of wrestlers will take that payday, but I, I'm very much, I view this as an artist and I will, like, I, I don't care when it comes to when it comes to certain things that a lot of wrestlers do. Um, but um, no, I, I can pinpoint it for you. Um, the question mark, uh, Josephus, uh, Joseph Hudson and NWA, we were friends before that. Um, and he was, you know, we met at Impact. Um, he was a part of the original NWA. Or not the original, but the the new era NWA, the the OG new era, and um, Billy goes, "Hey, I'm going to put you and Josephus together. We have a character called the Question Mark." Okay, 
we were sitting in the stands in Georgia public broadcasting and, and he's like, well, I got the tights and it's this and that, and this is, you know, it's going to be retro and blah, blah, blah. And, 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 you know, we were very good friends, but he asked me, he goes like, what do I do? And I just said, you are going to be a karate master. And he kind of looked at me, so like, should I get a belt and a gi? I went, no, you are going to parody the era that, people associate with the NWA dusty circa 1982, right? All that, that kind of stuff. Um, we're going to play this as straight as possible. This is not, we are not going to be goofy. Okay. Because if you're goofy, yeah, it'll, we have to play this. Like this is exactly who we are. Right. And yes, it's going to be comical. My God, if you looked at us, I was in a karate suit with my belt and one of the I had the world's biggest black belt. As I say, I was like one of the the lengths of the belt was like 10 feet long or something. And I had a third degree black belt and I put the three stripes on it. That all evolved. But originally he was going to be like the guy that they bring in from Mongolia to work Dusty. You know, he, they bring him in, they build him up for six or nine months. He has a big program with Dusty and he goes away. But the buildup is he's got the big you know, the, the secret Mongrovian or Mar, I'm sorry, Mongolian fork or the Mongolian spike. And, um, and so we, you know, go to Billy, Hey, um, what do you think of this? He goes, we should invent our own country. Okay. So right then and there, he comes up with Mongrovia. Well, Joseph's brother was a graphic design artist who came up with the flag and then we just like it literally just took off into a thing. And I said, look, I I do not want you to think I'm politicking or anything, but this is how you play this character, right? If we're going to be together. And, and it was like in a, a situation similar to me and Miz where they hated me, but they loved him. Right. So he's an immigrant now that I'm taking advantage of him. And I'm, I'm like shystering him out of his money. And I go, you're going to say one word. Every time I say karate, you have to stop me and you physically do it with your hand because fans are going to know what's coming eventually. So I'm a third degree black belt in karate and he'd stop me and he'd lean over and he'd karate and he'd say it like that. And then pretty much after like the second time they saw our act, everybody was chanting that. And, uh, you know, I said, well, Joseph, guess what? You now can sell T-shirts. You're welcome. Um, but, but he took that and he ran with it. Right. And then he would call me and he would be like, man, I just did a signing. And like, my line was longer than so-and-so who was like one of the top guys, uh, at the promotion at the time. And like, he's like, I can't believe it. Like Sid's coming up to me saying it and like, everyone loves this. So this is crazy. And, um, I, through him, because when I was going through that dark period, he was there for me. Right. And this is before I even knew I was ever going to come back to wrestling. Um, but through his perspective on the business where this was all new to him, like I hadn't been seen in years and I walked out and the fans right away. Right. Like, and I, it, it's something I had taken for granted. Right. Cause performance wise. Yeah. I'm going to put everything, but, but I, I had taken the fact that like, man, I, I have this amazing relationship with the fans. Um, because like to me it was always just a one-sided thing like i'm gonna give you everything i have and that's it but but like they've always appreciated me and and, and like when he was telling me what he was experiencing being over really and I'm, I'm gonna call it what it is he was over um it it caused me to have a um oh sorry i'm gonna call here we're gonna just there we go um there we go we all good yep that vince no, sorry, that was like, Vince uh, calling, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely hit the, the mute button on that one. Um, <laughs> but he he caused me to appreciate everything I had. And he caused me to kind of like I, I view the business through question mark tinted glasses. as I, And I, I still kind of say that to where um, Tim Storm has a saying, I'm grateful every time. Um I, I I I appreciate everything now even more, um, and I, that's because of him. And like I, I I can look back on the career I've had and like some of the cool things that have happened in my career, um, and I, I kind of look back and I I appre I have a greater and deeper appreciation for it because of him, and um, 
you know, he, um, he, God, it was 20, 2021, I believe where he just, uh, it was February. I'll never forget it. Um, and I communicated with him that morning and then I got a call that night, Billy, he, he passed and it was just like, it still doesn't feel real, but it's nice that, you know, the Mongrovian flag still hangs. Um, and, um, and, and like, I owe Joseph Hudson in, in terms of like the wrestler I am post question mark era. Um, as, as a human being, he changed who I was. Uh, and, and as a wrestler, he changed who I was. And and that's, um, you know, I, I still have uh, his mask in my bag. And, um, you know, every, every time I go to the ring, a piece of him goes with me. Yeah. I know that sounded super corny, but it's true. So No, I understand. I understand. No. Lars, is there anything else? I know we've had him for a while and... You know, I would, I, I guess, where, where do we find you on the interwebs? Well, uh, uh, oh God, I'm horrible at this. Uh, all right. Instagram is the Aaron Files, T H E A R O N Files. And uh, Twitter or X, as it is now known, is Aaron's Thoughts, A R O N S Thoughts. I refuse to pay for a blue check mark. Um, you know, that, that's a, it's a whole scape because every idiot has a check mark now. I mean, it, it's deceptive. Like, how do you know if someone's legitimate? And Instagram, my God, there's like 10 or 15 accounts people pretending to be me. And they're like, oh, we, uh, we can't verify you because of uh, this. Okay, whatever. Who cares? You know what? This is what it is. Well, uh, I'm absolutely a fan. I love your live videos. I think I said this off the air. Thank that you. Anytime you Thank go you. live, I do like it'll pop up on Facebook or IG. I don't oh. remember which one I watch them. And uh, you're one of those few people that actually sit there and do the videos and actually talk and converse with fans. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a fan, I totally appreciate that because you you get on these videos with people and it's them talking at you, but not really, you know, going back and forth. So as one of those guys that have been in your chat rooms, thank you for that. Right on. Appreciate it, man. So thank listen, you. Uh, thank you for 386. This was actually a very amazing, fun interview. Uh, for everybody at home, the podcast is over. We're going to say our goodbyes off the air, Wrestling Perspective. We got the new email address. Make sure you get your emails in there. It's Wrestling Perspective Podcast now at gmail.com. No longer Wrestling Perspective Pod, so don't get it mixed up. Thank you guys so much, Aaron. Thank you so much for carving some time out of your night here, hanging out with us. Uh, I, I can't wait to say thank you off the air, so I totally appreciate yeah. it. Right on. Thank you guys for having me. This was this was a blast.